Well, hello and welcome back to Who's Art It? I'm Doug and I'm with a very special guest today and we're going to be talking about some slightly more serious topics. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Francis Bildner. Francis is a multidisciplinary artist who has been painting for 40 years, has had shows all over the world, sells internationally. Uh, she's actually got a studio in the Keep Artist space and I'm so pleased to have her here on the show today. But we're also talking a little bit about some of the current events and specifically raising money and awareness around the situation that's happening in the US right now around abortion, uh, women's rights and women's freedoms. Uh, and we will be selling this fantastic piece from Francis and half of the proceeds will be going to Planned Parenthood to assist uh, in any charity efforts. So if you want to find out about that, you can go check out the website, uh, support Keep Artists, support the artists who are trying to make a difference. So I'd love to hear, uh, so this is a very intense piece. Uh, I believe it's called Giving Birth the American Way. Um, do you want to tell us about uh, this piece itself and maybe why we discussed it being an appropriate piece to represent some of the things that are happening now? Okay, so this piece was done a long time ago after my second son was born. And I had a wonderful experience with my first son in this country with a great gynecologist, very relaxed, very private, but you know, not, not about the money, it was about you know, the care and he was just fantastic. Then I had my second son in New York and I had a horrible experience with a gynecologist there. And I just saw him as wanting to make money and therefore this, uh, these are two robots with dollar signs and this woman has got absolutely no control over anything and they're just wanting the money. It's almost like an assault, this painting. Um, and that's how I saw it over there. I was one day in the hospital, I had a horrific you know, gynecologist who was also responsible for some illegal adoption by some guy who killed his baby. I mean, it was really just awful. So it prompted me and I was very um, ready to paint this. So, yeah, I mean, this, this interview came about because I was talking about feeling inspired to maybe do a painting on what's happening with the abortion situation that does seem like an assault in many respects mm -hmm. on people's freedoms. Absolutely. And, but I also realized I wasn't necessarily the best place to reflect on that. That's not necessarily my story in many respects. Um, so what is the, you know, we talked a little bit about anger and I'd like to understand where this sits in a historical context for you. I mean, do you think we're, it's the same fight? Does it feel like a different fight? Or, you know, how has it changed over the years? Well, well, I think, first of all, when I lived in the States and I was at NYU at, at university, uh, there was a wonderful poster with a couple. And in the middle of the poster, they had a senator. And it was like the senator was making up the minds of what was happening with a couple legally, you know, having babies, not having babies. And you're saying you have no place to talk. I mean, you do. I mean, everybody has a voice. But I think what they're doing in the States now is muzzling people more even than they were doing when it was Roe versus Wade because then beforehand abortion had always been illegal in most countries and then they overturned that. And we've had that kind of liberality. I mean, it's to me, it's not even liberal. It's just a given that women have control over their own body, my body, my choice. And now it's been decided by these conservative judges. So things have changed even more radically towards muzzling women, stopping their freedom, the assault. It's well, changed. It's got worse. You have a woman in, in the state, in the Supreme Court, who was put in there by Trump, who is as conservative as they come. She's got six children, Catholic, and has decided, you know, a little bit like we smog over here, that abortion is not, not, not for anybody. And it's not up to her to do that. It's a punitive stance against sexuality in many respects, and specifically female sexuality, because men can have sex all they want and not need an abortion. But if, because there's also pushes in the same states that are making abortion illegal to make contraception harder to get. Now exactly. to me, exactly. those two are completely at odds. It's like, right, okay, you don't want abortion, but if you're gonna do that, give people contraception for of God's course. sake, you know, like, Of course yeah. you do, of course you have to give people contraception. I remember going to rallies to support, you know, I remember going to protest KKK rallies when I was you know, 10 years old. Um, and it was very, very anti-abortion and very anti-sexuality in a 
broad sense. So it, it is a very strange thing. But female sexuality in particular, you know, I think is, is something that um, needs to be, continues to be a struggle to, to express, to accept for society, for specifically for more traditionalist members of society. But if you think about the pill, right, it came out in the 60s, maybe before that, people were, you know, sexuality was, was a really carefully thought out thing. You didn't have sex before you got married because you know, all the implications. But now, it, you're absolutely right. You have to think three times before you, you know, or, or you go, and you unfortunately get pregnant, have to go and get an abortion somewhere else. I mean, they've, just, they've done that in Ireland for years. But, you know, this is 2022, and we are talking about women's rights to have, to, to you know, be able to sort of control their own bodies. And their, and their sexuality, which I think I, I just find it extraordinary that there's even a debate going. On. Yeah, I mean it's 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 pretty far fetched. I mean, if you told me ten years ago that this was going to be the case, I probably would have. I mean, there's just so much societal value to giving women more freedom, sexual freedom. But giving, you see, the words. Not really giving. Mean, yeah, I mean, yeah, you're, you're right. You don't mean that. Yeah, yeah. Giving, but this is what I. A lot. Like, right. You have, you have, you know, language is really important. You have people talking about women's rights. You have to, you know, giving women equal rights. I mean, it's not giving. It's, it is a given that women should be having the same rights all along, you know, as, as, as anybody else. Just like, like anything like that. Yeah. You know, and it's always, to me, that the man is conferring the rights on a woman. I mean, it's, we're still second class citizens in many ways. I mean, what is the path? away from that. I mean, I know art has a place to inspire people, open people's minds a bit, yeah. encourage discourse, but what are some of the other, what, what, what are your strategies maybe for how to bring people back into the fold? I don't know. I mean, I think you have to talk about it. I think, I'm not sure about baby steps. We're going to do baby steps for the next 10 years. You know, I think we need to have a radical movement that is out there. I mean, You've seen it now recently in the States, in New York, and I don't know about London, but New York, California, I mean, they're all marching. This country has actually got, uh, it's easier to change things in this country than it is in the U.S., unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Things in the U.S., uh, I mean, the way the political, people, people loud the founding fathers. So, I mean, so it's an interesting one, because when we started on abortion, and their whole premise is putting that childhood period on a pedestal of sacrosanct space. You know, I wonder what you think about uh, where those intersect, because you obviously think that there's a magic to childhood. So if you're trying to protect children, children don't, are not, you know, Tom Conti always said, no child is ever asked to be brought into the world, right? So when you bring a child into the world, you have a responsibility. If you want to make that child have a magical childhood, you better make sure that they're wanted, that they're looked after properly, etc. If you're a pregnant 16-year-old in, in Mississippi and you don't want this child, and you've been raped, how, how magical is that childhood going to be? If, you even, if the child even survives it, it's horrendous. Yeah. You know, a childhood that's equal, you can't spout these words, child is, is magical. You have a responsibility as a parent. And the government has a responsibility not to put unwanted children into the world because it's a disaster. Yeah. So give them a good childhood and don't, don't sort of bring them in to, because, you know, because they have to be born. Yeah. So, tell me a little bit about how you got into the arts. Well, um, when I was 13, I didn't really care too much about painting, but I was in my boarding school in, a, in the art class and we had, a, um, we had a bunch of flowers, hydrangeas or whatever, we had to, um, to, to paint. And I saw, and I was 13, and at 12 and at 13, most children have, have liked to do realistically. That, that, that's the most important thing. And I'm watching my friend next to me paint her very carefully painting, and I started doing it very carefully, and then I just went to her with this, and I went, choo, 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 choo. and the woman, the art teacher put that painting into, she said, I'm putting this in, two years later, I'm putting it into the um, uh, competition in East Sussex. And I said, ah, that, you can throw that out. And we got the call, and they said, you just, your daughter's just won first prize out of 300 pa paintings, you know, people entering this competition. And so Charles Wheeler, the past president of the Royal Academy, wants to buy the painting. 
Sir Thomas Mornington, etc. I was televised, I was in the paper, etc., etc. And um, in the end, my mother, there was an auction, and my mother outbid Sir Charles Weaver, which was ridiculous, because I could have been at, at 13, you know, what, 15, they bought it, but I could have been in a public collection at that point. Anyway, I moved to New York in, when I was 18, and I got a studio with a group of other people, and I've been painting ever since. What are some of your, so New York in the, that must have been the 70s, that the must 70s. have been. That was great. What is your favorite? It was great, except, except that what I love about, I don't like the internet, as you know, Doug, I'm not that crazy about technology, as you know, <laughs> but what I do like is the sense of immediacy. I'm quite an immediate person, I'm quite a New Yorker, really, I like things done fast, and of course today you can, you can do that. You can get on the internet, you can email people. Then we had to get our slides together, send them to the gallery. It took two weeks for them to look at it. Then, you know, but the whole process took about a month. Yeah. But the art was, it was a great scene. And I had, um, I was in a gallery in East Village with stuff like this and very raw, you know, like really raw emotional paintings in a small gallery and we exhibited there and it was great. So much fun. So, I mean, I've been working with you for <coughs> some time, yeah. and when I see these works, <coughs> these, you know me, I put these ones up, because um, I respond to them, and a lot of the staff at Keyboard are also really uh, passionate about them. You know, there's this one, there's uh, the FGM piece, which is very powerful. I mean, your more modern work is going towards abstraction. Yes. What was that transition like? Um, well, I, d I did a lot of figurative, I did, I did flowers, very, very bold flowers for a while. Um, and then I just went into abstraction. For me, I'm not. I'm much more comfortable with pure colour than I am with drawing, really. And so I just kind of, and that's what I ended up doing more of the, the abstraction. It was quite an easy transition. I still do a, fi a bit of figurative work, but it's more abstraction. I'd like. To, I'd love to see. I mean, it's been a few years, right, since you've done figure. I'd love to see what it looks like after a few years in abstraction. To kind of come back to figurative to work. Go, to go back to figurative yeah, work. Yeah, I'd love to see what that looks like. I don't think there would be much difference, to be honest with you. you still be, somebody once said to me, there was a drawing class I was in in, in Pars a Parsons School of Design, they said, and the person with the most soul here is Francis. And I was like, I don't really know what that means. But anyway, that's what she saw. And somebody else said, you're a, you are a primitive. So when you draw, I mean, I never draw, you know, very academically or when you won't look like you, but I'll draw out, it'll be more expressive, it'll be more, not expressive, expressionist. I'll, I'll draw you as I think I see you, rather than what you really look like. So maybe we could do a portrait yeah, of each other sometime. Yeah, why not, why not? Yeah. So that sort of thing, you know. We often talk about kind of the balance between uh, creating paintings and artwork or music or poetry, and then also how to balance that with making an income. Now, Francis has been running uh, 30 years, 20 years? Yeah, 32 years. 32 years of uh, after school art program in London called Creative Wish Kids? Yeah, holiday clubs. Holiday for clubs. Kids. Ho holiday clubs, birthday parties. And then, you know, has, have you found that that provided you the right platform to make your own art and? No, no, I don't think I had, I, it kind of ran side, parallel. I've never really, I mean, I've never really had a lot of, I've, I've had, a, I mean, I've sold a few paintings to clients with kids, but I haven't really, they, they don't really meld too much, no. And I love working with kids, I mean, I think their art is extraordinary, especially if parents keep out of the way <laughs> and don't get all busy. No, because kids are fabulous artists, and I've always said that, but you get these parents who are like, you know, holding onto their children's hands and getting all busy, busy, helicoptering around, and I just think, just out, I, out, you know. I, 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 um, you know me well enough to know I, I allow my kids to make whatever they want, but I'm a little compulsive, so they have to do it somewhat neatly. Can't, can't get paint all over the floor. No, well, that's okay. That's it, okay. I mean, yeah, well, yeah, some that's parents, enough, that's not how you paint. No, you, I, you, you, I paint everywhere. Yeah, yeah. You, you did a painting in, in here last week, and there was literally painting in four different places. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'm, I'm a bit of a messy painter. But yeah, I mean, I think, I think children are fabulous artists. I've always said that. You know, well, because they're not, when they're children, they're not inhibited. They don't, you know, they're not thinking, does it look like such and such? Up to the age of 12, that's when the magic goes, is magical age, up to the age of 12. So, thanks so much for coming in. You can, we'll put the links for Francis's work. You can find some of it on the Keep Art website, uh, LinkedIn, Instagram, Francis Bildner. Uh, we'll have links. Website. Website, website yeah. something like that. Oh, yeah. um, thanks so much for coming in. It's uh, a pleasure, it's been fun.
If you like this kind of program, we'd love if you click that subscribe button. That's really what allows us to keep doing this and it is important to create spaces for honest and truthful dialogue and discourse. Thank you for your candid honesty about this very potent issue and um, we'll see you next time. I'm Doug, this is Francis, and remember to keep on. Yeah, thanks Doug.